What's up everybody, it's your boy. If you're new here, welcome to my channel. If not, welcome back. On today's video, we're gonna talk about how you can easily buy your first rental property for either zero or a little money down. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and smash that little notification bell if you find this video helpful, as I'll try to upload videos every week on all things Denver, Colorado, real estate, and investing. Now, before I get into it, as a quick reminder, I am a licensed real estate agent out here in Denver, Colorado. So if you have any questions whatsoever about moving here or the current real estate market, feel free to drop a comment or reach out to the information below, and I'll be happy to help you in any way I can. Now, with that out of the way, let's get into it. All right, step one of this process is to start saving money. Chances are, if you're buying your very first property, you might not have the money available as of yet, so you have to start saving it to get that down payment. So you can get into an owner-occupied home for as low as 3% down, or if you're a veteran or find a USDA eligible area, you can even get in with 0% down. There are actually some programs out there that'll help with your down payment. So for example, out here in Colorado, we have what's called Chaffa, and they'll help with up to 3% of your down payment with no repayment required. The other general requirements for Chaffa out here in Colorado is you have to put at least $1,000 down to contribute, and you have to have at least a 620 credit score. If you're curious about if your state has some, all you have to do is go to Google and type in, let's say for example, Arizona down payment assistance, and it'll pop up with whatever that state or your state has. Step number two is you're gonna to wanna to start building your credit. The better credit you have, the better rates you're gonna get, and the more you could uh, potentially qualify for. When working on your credit, you're gonna to wanna to make sure you focus on the two main factors, which are your payment history and the amount of debt you have. Both of these factors make up about 65% of your total credit score. So even if you can't pay off, let's say a car loan or a credit card in full at the end of the month, make sure you're at least making the minimum payment and making that payment on time. That way you can boost your credit. The other factors to consider when looking at your credit are the amount of credit pulls you have in a two year window and your mix of credit. So that means having a different mix of credit cards, car loans, student loans, all those different things to boost your credit. The next step or step three will be talking to a lender to get pre-approved. Your pre-approval amount will be dependent on several factors, including your income, your cash and other assets, interest rates at the time, your debt to income ratio, and also your current credit score. When you're talking to a lender to get pre-approved, you're gonna need all your paperwork to give to that lender. So it's gonna be your W-2s, your bank statements, and any kind of brokerage statements you have for uh, investments in stocks and other assets. Now this step is critical because if, let's say, you go out and find a house you really like, and you go find the lender after you find that house, chances are, especially in this market right now, that house could be off the market or under contract by the time you get all your paperwork into your lender, and that lender approves you for the loan. All right, the fourth step in this process is to identify the type of property you wanna go after. If this is your first property, chances are you're probably gonna be looking for either a single family house, a duplex, a triplex, or a quadplex, because these properties allow you to put a little money down with favorable terms. I personally don't recommend townhouses or condos because there's not a whole lot of value add you can do for those because you can't add any square footage or do any add-ons. And their HOA fees typically will eat into your cash flow substantially. However, if you're in a market that makes sense for a townhouse or condo, let's say you're in a touristy area, uh, you could buy a condo or townhouse and Airbnb the extra rooms you have in there to potentially get some cash flow that way, but this will only work in specific markets. So you'll just have to figure out your specific market you're in, get to know the area and what properties work for your market. Once you determine the type of property you wanna go after, next you're gonna to wanna to start analyzing properties to determine what the cash flow will be for those specific properties. Now this step will take a while as most retail houses won't cash flow great. You're gonna be looking at a lot of properties just to find that one good one. However, the nice thing is if let's say you find something that'll at least allow you to break even and live in there for free, down the road, once you get rid of your private mortgage insurance, which you're gonna be paying every month because you're not putting 20% down, plus the increases in the rent every year, it could turn it into a great cash flowing property down the road. As a quick example, let's say you found a three bed, two bath, single family house for $350,000 and you're gonna be putting 3% down. That means your loan is gonna be about $339,500, which comes out to about $1,500 per month, assuming about a 3.2% interest rate. Let's also assume about $175 a month in property taxes, $150 a month in homeowner's insurance, and another $100 in PMI per month 
because like I said before, you're not putting the 20% down and your lender will cry, require you to have the PMI attached. So all in, you'll be about $1,900 a month to live there. Once you determine how much it's gonna cost you per month, you're then gonna wanna figure out how much you can make per month off of it. My favorite place to look are rentometer.com, the Facebook Marketplace, and Craigslist. This way you can get an idea of what other people are charging in your market and also get an idea of market rents overall for the area. Now, because we're buying a single family house with three beds, you're gonna be living in one of those and renting out the other two. So you'll wanna look on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist will probably be your best bet to find out what other people are renting out individual rooms for in your area with the same kind of house. Let's just assume that each room in the area would rent for about $950 a month. So you've got the two rooms for 950, that's a total of $1,900 per month in rent you're getting from those tenants or your roommates, offsetting your $1,900 total of living expenses to pay for the principal interest, taxes, insurance, and the private mortgage insurance. So essentially you'll be breaking even on this for now, or you'll be living for free minus utilities. Now let's assume after a year you decide to go do this again. So you rent out the house you're currently in to let's say a family or one person and you go buy something else. That house, let's say it rents for $2,300 a month. So that $2,300 minus your $1,900 all in payment is now you're cash flowing $400 a month on that previous house. That means in the first year you'll be bringing in $4,800 uh, from just the rents alone, add on the $5,000 in principal pay down that you'll be paying down on your mortgage for a total return of about $9,800 for the first year. And let's also assume that there's 5% appreciation in your area, which means the property went up by, let's say 5%. So now your $350,000 house is now worth $367,500. Now it might take a little while to get the analysis down, but once you look at enough houses in your market, you'll start to get it down and can start looking at houses just online without analyzing them and have a rough idea of what they would cash flow and what they would cost. All right, once you analyze enough houses and you find the right one, it's time to start putting offers in. You're gonna to wanna to find a good agent and lender to get you through this process to help you find not only on-market deals, but also off-market properties as well. Some great places to find off-market deals are actually Craigslist and Facebook. Uh, you're gonna wanna find ones that are for rent. You can hopefully find a tired landlord that is maybe sick of renting and being a landlord and just wants to offload the property. So that while they might have it up for rent, you can shoot them a message, say, hey, I'm in the market to buy a house. Are you interested in selling it? And kind of just go through the list until you find one that hits. You're also gonna wanna get on wholesaler lists. And if you're not familiar with what a wholesaler is, they're essentially going out, finding off-market properties, getting the house under contract, selling that contract to an investor. And you can typically get a better deal with an off-market property than an on-market property, especially in this market where, at least out here in Denver, you have some houses with 15 to 30 offers on each house. Now, finding the right property could take a long time. You might be putting in a lot of offers until you get something accepted. But even if it's taking a while and you're getting discouraged, don't waver on your criteria and make sure you stick to what you are looking for. All right, once you put in enough offers and you finally get something under contract, you're then gonna get the inspection and the appraisal ordered for the house. They usually run about $500 each and your agent can give you a few inspectors or schedule the inspection for you. And your lender is actually gonna order the appraisal once you guys are through the inspection period. The inspection will go over everything about the property, so make sure you find yourself a good inspector. Uh, and once you have the inspection report, you can either use it to get seller concessions or have the seller make a repair. You can use it to, let's say there's something really wrong with the house and you don't wanna deal with it. You can back out of the, the contract and get your earnest money back. Or if you decide there's nothing wrong with the house or if the issues that you found really aren't that big of a deal to you, you can decide to go and move forward with the contract without asking for any repairs or concessions. All right, finally, once you get through the inspection and appraisal periods and you close in the house and it's officially yours, now it's time to start filling the rooms. You're gonna wanna make sure you have a good lease in place for your tenants. Uh, might even be worth it to pay a real estate attorney a few hundred bucks to either draft one up for you um, or look over an existing one you have to make sure that uh, there's all the stuff in there that you want and there's no issues that you could see that could arise. Now this type of investing that we just went over and covered is known as house hacking. 
the term is somewhat new, but the whole concept behind it is nothing new. People have been doing it for a long time and it's a great way to get started in investing. If you have any additional questions about investing or the Colorado real estate market, feel free to drop a comment below and I'll be happy to respond and help you out. Uh, if you're also interested in getting the spreadsheet I showed earlier on the screen, I did create that one, so I'll be happy to send it to you. Just drop your email below. And don't forget to like, subscribe, and smash that notification bell. And I'll see you on the next one.